Hello, everyone, and welcome to ACS Webinars, connecting you with the best and brightest minds in chemistry and other sciences, live from Washington, DC. I'm Michael David, and I will be your host for your broadcast today, which we are proudly co-producing with the Science History Institute and Chemical and Engineering News. Today, we will be joined by Vijay Kapoor, the retired CEO of International Solar Electric Technology. Vijay will discuss the past, current status, and future of photovoltaics, and its potential to solve a variety of global problems. And now, I'm going to turn the program over to Lisa A. Grissom, who is the Senior Philanthropy Advisor at the Science History Institute, to tell us about today's speaker and moderator. Thank you, Mike. Welcome to the Science History Institute in Philadelphia and to our Joseph Priestley Society program series. We are delighted to be co-producing with the ACS webinars. It's my pleasure to introduce our program leaders for today. Dr. Vijay Kapoor will be our speaker. Vijay is the retired CEO of International Solar Electric Technology, which operated in Los Angeles for 27 years, developing and patenting low-cost photovoltaic technologies as alternatives to silicon solar cells. Dr. Kapoor and his team developed a cost-effective technology for manufacturing thin film CIGS solar cells using printing or spraying techniques. For these activities, Dr. Kapoor secured multiple R&D contracts from the DOE, DOD, NASA, and the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization and the state of California. I said concepts and accomplishments influenced other solar companies worldwide. Dr. Kapoor received his PhD in physical inorganic chemistry from the University of Pennsylvania and his executive MBA from the University of California, Los Angeles. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. The Q&A will be conducted by Dr. Bill Szynski. Bill is currently a partner at the UNAMI Group LLC, serving as sales agent for and providing market development and market research consulting to multiple clients. Bill holds a BS in biochemistry from Manhattan College and a PhD in inorganic chemistry from Cornell. Bill serves on the executive committee and is the program chair for the Joseph Priestley Society. Now to begin our program, I present Dr. Kapoor, Vijay. Greetings. It's a pleasure to be in front of this international audience. And I'm gonna talk about advances in solar power and how they can be utilized for the sustainability. The sustainability challenges are, as you can see, listed here on this slide. Number one, which is very important, is climate change. The issues about access to clean water, eco-friendly agriculture, zero emission transmit transportation, access to digital information, education, economic opportunities, healthcare, affordable and comfortable habitats, heating and cooling, cooking facilities, and power eradication. These are some of the challenges which are also part of the UN Sustainability Development Goals. And as you can see, I, abundant and low-cost solar energy provides possible solutions to all of these challenges. There's not gonna be enough time for me to cover each and every one of these, but I will refer to them as I go along in the presentation. And uh, some of them I may not be able to cover because of limited time. Nonetheless, let's just first spend a little bit of time on the climate change. This is a very serious problem that the whole humanity is facing. And the problem is, as you can see on these, this slide, the carbon dioxide, you know, global warming concept is quite misunderstood. In the sense, when you say it's a global warming, when you, a few years ago, we had the Northeaster here, the re, uh, people say, where is the global warming? The reality is global warming means there is a disruption in the natural cycle that we are used to and that's causing a lot of problems. And as you, some of us know very well how the climate change is affecting the, um, you know, even climate around here. The 
carbon dioxide level, some of it is very natural. Pre-industrial um, revolution, which started somewhere in the 18th century or so, was of the order of something like 250 parts per million. And today, I noticed that on October 20, 2020, the PPM level is 411. And it's really mind boggling that the cumulative level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 3,200 billion metric tons. And the way we are uh, functioning on this planet, we're putting easily about 40 billion metric tons every year. And carbon dioxide, some of you who are chemists, is a very stable compound. And it has a very long life and it stays there in the atmosphere. So if we keep on adding more and more, the CO2 level in the atmosphere is increasing. And the major effect of this climate change, as you as I pointed out, very frequent extreme weather events. I lived in California for 40 years. The California's rainfall for the entire season used to be typically about 13 inches. And if you have seen the news lately, somewhere in south, southern states where they're having a lot of hurricanes, they have about a foot of rain in 24 hours. Also, this climate change is creating problems, particularly for the lack of fresh water. The good source of fresh water in most of the countries, particularly the underdeveloped countries, have been the molten water, uh, water coming from the molten glaciers. The glaciers now have disappeared, particularly I know in some of the Himalayan glaciers have disappeared. Simultaneously, there is a rising sea level, rising sea temperature, and this has caused lots of problems, particularly people who are living in different islands. Some of these islands have disappeared. So there's a, there are hundreds of millions of climate refugees. Okay, there are some urgent actions that we need to take in order to arrest this. Otherwise, we are really on a very rapid slope to disaster. First of all, we have to make sure that we cut down the greenhouse gases, particularly the carbon dioxide. But again, methane is another greenhouse gas which comes out of particularly the fracking in this state of Pennsylvania. We actually have no choice but to cut down the use of fossil fuels. In the course of our economic development over the last few uh, centuries or so, we really uh, removed lots of forests for farming and what have you. Actually, forests and greenery is also a very effective way of fixating carbon dioxide. So we need to really replenish the last greenery by way of planting trees. Our agriculture practices all over the world are also highly questionable now. The main focus behind that has been to uh, economic reason to make more money, but we have really disrupted the natural cycle of growing foods, particularly with the uh, genetically modified seeds and the chemical uh, fertilizers, and they are already making mess in our climate. In terms of the, uh, we also have a lot of transportation, of course, and transportation is also one of the major contributors to the greenhouse gases. So we need to change to public transportation as much as we can, and preferably with the either electric vehicles, or now the new thing that's coming up is the hydrogen fuel cell powered public transportation. It's already being used in some countries. Sustainable agriculture and particularly, I think that there's a trend now to grow locally the organic food. And uh, there's also, some of you may be aware of the fact that 
the country of uh, Netherlands is very, very prolific in vertical farming. Now, vertical farming means you control the environment within a building and you're not depending upon the uh, natural environment, which is highly disrupted. So the message here is, in order to take care of all of these issues, we need to really maximize the use of solar energy. Now, let's just look into what the sun is offering us. Now, although it says, here comes the sun is the title of our talk, but sun has been always here. <laughs> it's been a ubiquitous sunshine that has been sustaining life on this planet Earth for billions of years. Now, if you look at this, um, this slide here, it's amazing how much of energy is being showered on this planet. Compared to that, the coal, the oil, the gas, of course, the uranium is, is a nuclear uh, source. And we've been just going after these ancient sources of coal, oil, and gas. But there are also indirect sources of solar energy, such as hydro and wind. And what is really amazing, that the entire world's annual consumption of power or energy that is showered on this planet in less than one hour. So if we only learn how to harness that energy in a, in a environmentally safe way, there's a lot that can be done. And the challenge there is to use the solar energy that's available without polluting the environment. Let's say very quickly, I gave this talk, uh, photovoltaics, uh, past, present, and future last year here at the Science History Institute. And that was heavily focused on the photovoltaics. But today's talk is going to be much broader in the use of solar energy. Here's the slide for the solar spectrum. As you notice there, air mass zero is the amount of uh, solar power that comes out on, on the outer space. Air mass 1.5, and that is 1.37 kilowatt per meter square. And this amount of po solar power that is incident upon the surface of the earth is called one, air mass 1.5, and that's a kilowatt on a square meter. And here's a spectrum of the solar energy. You could see there's a lot of infrared. The visible part is all this colored chart. Moving on, there's plenty of sunshine available all over the world. Obviously, close to the equator, all you see this you see the chart here, they're the ones that are close to the of the country, they get a lot more sunshine. In the United States, um, as, as it's quite obvious, you got a lot more sunshine in Arizona, California, Texas, New Mexico. And uh, the way the solar guys look at it, how, what are, how many hours do we have peak hours of sunlight. So what that means is you, you look at the whole day's sunshine and you integrate that to the equivalent to what's the noontime solar incident and figure out how many hours that be. Now, I, this one shows here, I think uh, in Philadelphia here, we get somewhere around 3.8 to four hours of peak sunlight. That covers the entire year. In the summertime, you have more sunlight, and in wintertime, of course, less, but if you average it out, it's about 3.8 to 4 hours. Okay, now how do we harness this solar energy? Of course, there are a uh, number of ways. One is the solar thermal. There are those of you who travel in the western part of this country. Uh, there are solar thermal plants near Las Vegas where they have a whole lot of mirrors focusing on a tower that is collecting tower, it's a molten salt. And there are a number of other ways to do the solar power generation. I'm not gonna cover that part on this. However, we will talk about solar thermal and photovoltaics. So as I said, my previous talk was all about photovoltaics. So some of my 
uh, material in this presentation is also borrowed from my previous talk. So you see the solar thermal collectors can be used to provide heat. Now, it, what is really mind boggling, and we haven't paid attention to this, 50% of all the energy the world uses is going into heating either water or heating space or for process heating. We haven't paid a lot of attention to that. Why? Because we have had so many of these fossil fuels readily available. We may have to change our mindset now. So we'll talk briefly about that and some very interesting facts. And of course, for electricity, we're going to use photovoltaics. Briefly, photovoltaics is actually, this is a direct conversion of sunlight into DC electricity. Unlike other systems where you heat the water, you create the steam and you run the turbine, there is no such thing. If you see a schematic of a solar cell here, sun shines on a semiconductor and it creates a, a electron and hole pair and then the device is configured in such a way they are separated and then there's a current flowing out for a single junction solar cell this slide on the right shows the ideal band gap for a semiconductor is close to 1.5 silicon that is very commonly used for the solar panels today is approximately is about electron is one electron volt we'll, we'll briefly talk about that so what is happening now that beyond this there has been a lot of research and development that has gone and some exciting work has gone on people are making multi-junction solar cells that that relate to the different uh uh, ask a different side of the solar spectrum, and I'll talk about that. Now, very briefly, the first generation of solar cell initially was all monocrystalline silicon solar cell. As I said, I've been in the game for 40 years or more. Uh, they also developed technology for instead of growing single crystal, did the polycrystal cast silicon material, and they figured out how to make it more efficient. And early on, the solar cells were being used for the space program. And in the space program, even though silicon crystal, uh, crystal and silicon were used, but most of this, the items that are used in space program were the P5 compound semiconductors like gallium arsenide. Second generation, we got the thin film solar cells coming in. And my company spent quite some time working on thin film solar cells, although I did work on the crystalline silicon solar cells also. And those are amorphous silicon, copper, indium, gallium, selenide, cadmium, telluride, and of course, there are multi junction solar cells in that. The third generation that's coming up is still is pretty much in the laboratory, is the Prowskite structure solar cells, quite promising but still there are some challenges, organic PV, dye-sensitized solar cells, and quantum dots. Moving on, very, very briefly, the, the top of this uh, slide is the crystalline, single crystal silicon solar cells, which you grow into Chakralsky ingots, you cut them into wafers and made them into solar cells and solar panels. And this shows you the configuration of how the solar panel is encapsulated. Uh, they are, you know, clear glass and encapsulants on the top and bottom and the back sheet. But for the polycrystalline silicon, the, instead of growing a single crystal, which is a expensive and, and long time-consuming process, they now cast silicon. Now that is not coming out of the single crystal. The light comes out of the polycrystalline big blocks. They are cut into wafers and then converted into solar cells. These are the multi-junction, uh, the schematic of a multi-junction solar cell, which is based on the 3,5 compounds. What you see is, is gallium, indium gallium arsenides, and I think is a indium gallium phosphide. Well, it's called rainbow cell because it covers, it captures energy, most of the solar spectrum. And some of the, these concepts apply to the new materials have gone up to converting almost 50% of the sun solar energy 
to electric power. The going back to the crystalline silicon, typically the companies that are crystalline silicon solar cell company, they make solar panels that are approximately somewhere around 20 percent efficient. But if you increase the efficiency, you are collecting a lot more energy. So, but these C5 compounds are pretty darn expensive and they have to be grown into single crystals. So therefore, uh, there is a lot of activity going on in the new materials. And I mentioned to you the new materials are in, in thin films and some of these proboscite structure materials. Okay. This is just a chart and this shows you, this is a record that the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado, funded by DOE, maintains that uh, record. And you look at this, some of these, these are multi-junction solar cells. This is almost like 48% conversion efficiency. So progress is being made all over. It's just a question of how do we implement it. Now I'm gonna give you some very uh, historical uh, view of not too long ago, solar cells, not the solar paint, solar cells when they were being made out of silicon, the cost was almost 80 bucks a square, you know, a watt. Today, see from 77 to this is 2014, actually 2020 prices have even come down even further down. 2014, the cost of making silicon solar cells was 36 cents. Quite a dramatic change. And that had to do a lot with the learning the technology and economy of scale. And this is on this right side is the installed solar system on a resident. And you see the, the prices of that. In 2018, an installed solar system on somebody's house will cost only $2.70. Actually, that number is even lower than that today because even in two years, further improvement has taken place. Just another comparison here. Residential, we saw the 270. If you did the commercial, because the commercial now has a much higher uh, scale, and the, the scale, the price comes down. That number was dollar uh, 83 in 18. And there is also a way. I mean, uh, the fixed array means you got to install the solar panel this on a certain level, and it's fixed. But you can also track the sun starting from morning till the evening. And then there's also seasonal tracking. So one axis tracking during the day typically can add about 20% of extra output. So you see this, uh, the, this, this is a fixed tilt. The price is 106, but with the, this is one axis tracking and that is uh, $1.13 a watt. The reason for that is that the cost of tracking that is factored in. But it is a quite a dramatic uh, cost lowering in the system. So as a result, now this was, uh, <clears throat> this is an interesting chart. This dark green line is the solar. It's 2017, the solar, the cost of energy, localized cost of energy was $50 a megawatt hour. That means you got 1000 kilowatt hours in a megawatt hour, that'll be about five cents a kilowatt hour. However, those numbers have further come down. These are the goals that the Department of Energy Program, suns Sunset Progress and Goals, See, they, in 2020, they claim it was, residential was 10 cents, commercial is 8 cents, utility is 6 cents. I tell you, those numbers have further fallen down. And I, I should point out, PICO, the local utility company, negotiated a contract with an independent solar firm a couple of years ago, and they negotiated that contract for 3 cents a kilowatt hour. Pico has lowered the price for the residents here. It's about six and a half cents, but they are getting this energy for three cents a kilowatt hour. 
I looked into some of the numbers in India. <laughs> Negotiated price for long-term contracts was less than two cents a kilowatt hour. So the net result of all of this is solar produced electricity is cheaper than any other technique that we are familiar with. There's no more that stigma that it's expensive. It is very cost effective. Now, I'm gonna show you today in 2020, the worldwide electricity production capacity is about 6,613 gigawatts. I think the US is slightly less than 1,000 gigawatts. China is the biggest one that has over 1,000 gigawatts. And look at how the PV installation is growing. If you look at the 2020 here, in 2020, we are somewhere around 630 gigawatts worldwide. And in just less than 10 years or 10 years, it almost doubles that. So at this uh, level today, our installation, uh, worldwide installation is about 10% of the overall uh, power production. And in 3030, it'll be 20%. So that tells you this, it's slowly catching up. People are being aware of the fact that this is very cost effective. Okay. So the advantages of solar PV system, are, first of all, they convert you directly. The sunlight is directly from your DC power. You don't have to go through a thermal mechanical system, a turbine running and, and all that. They are quite reliable and they are modular in the sense you can always add on if the, the need grows and they can be installed at the site where you need it. Systems are very quiet, they don't make any noise. And they are very environmentally friendly and the lifespan of typical solar panels, it says 20 years, but I think now it is 25 years is taken as a, as a uh, standard. And <clears throat> while you can hook up the solar system to the grid system, but depending upon what location you are at, what What's the situation? You can install solar system at the site of usage without having a big transmission lines. So these are the advantages. Okay, question always comes up, well, how do you store the energy? Of course, the, these are different ways of energy, storing energy batteries. And I'll, sometime I will talk about that, but right, this is not the time. That's for the electric storage. Thermal uh, solar, which we will talk shortly, there are a number of ways to do that. Mechanical storage and hydrogen is coming up. If you have excess energy available to you, I mean, the Quebec Hydro in Canada that has so many hydro plants in the off peak hours, they electrolyze the water and produce hydrogen, but in that, they also produce heavy water. Pumped hydro is another way of storing energy. All right. So the grid connected system, typically you have a south facing part of your roof with the solar panels. The DC output is goes through an inverter and then it's fed back to the utility. That's called the, the net metering process, which unfortunately now utilities are afraid that the solar might challenge them. <laughs> they are putting some roadblocks. So the way it is done that in the Daytime, when you're not using electricity, if you have a solar panel on your rooftop, you sell the excess electricity back to the utility and get credit for that. And in the nighttime, when the sun is not shining, you use the utility. But if you have a standalone system that you are not connected to grid, you can have a battery, uh, the solar panel and inverter if you want to run the DC load. This is an example of a solar uh, carport charging the electric vehicles. Now, this is very interesting uh, concept, vertically mounted PV system. The rule of thumb is if you want to put the solar panels to maximize the output, you find out what latitude you are at and you take that inclination and you face south for the fixed array. And then in winter time, you just 
jack this up a little bit because the sun is on the lower angle. But five years ago, when I came back to Philadelphia from California, driving on Route 95, I saw this Eagles Stadium. And it's amazing. It's, it's about, uh, I think, something like 4.5 megawatts of solar panels that are all vertically mounted. That piqued my interest and I started looking into that. And it turns out with the cost of solar panels going down the way it is now, it's the cost of land that actually becomes more expensive. And particularly in big cities where you don't have real estate easily available, and if it is available, it's very costly. So how do you put the solar panels on? So you see here's an example of uh, Eagles in Philadelphia, New York, London, and surprisingly, now what happens here, as the your latitude goes up, higher the latitude, you can tilt the solar panels at a higher angle. But if you were on, on, in, uh, on the equator, you will have the solar panels almost sitting flat. But what is very interesting, I came across this article from somebody in India, Mumbai, the latitude is only 90.1 compared to say 40 that we are at, or London at 51. Even they have the solar panels vertically mounted. The reason for that is that when they calculate the return on investment, because the cost of land will be very high there in Mumbai. So vertical mounting is really going to be quite popular as the time goes on. And depend particularly in latitudes at 40 and above. Now, because the cost price cost of land is an issue, now what is happening? You see, there's another thing called photovoltaics. They, they can actually um, make a structure and put the solar panels on the surface of a body of body of water. May that be a lake, even an ocean, and particularly in the ocean. You, have, you can use that energy to desalinate water and have the ex, you know, water available easily. What is very interesting and very recent concept is agri-photovoltaics. That is because the farmers have a lot of land. If you're gonna go cover the whole lot of land, you might as well have a dual use. So by putting, this is a winery. I don't know the name of the winery on which the solar panels are. Same piece of land, the wines are growing and actually sitting, uh, having solar panels on the top cuts back the loss of moisture and actually cools the solar panels. Solar panel likes to be cooled. When they get hot, their energy output goes down. So it is a way for the farmers to have a two ways of uh, revenue stream. They can grow food, and they can also sell the electricity. It helps in the control the wind and soil erosion. It saves the water and improves the production of the uh, crops. These are some of the remote applications. I talked about uh, digital access, and for that you need cellular towers. And I'll be I'm taking a little pride. My younger brother in India is highly prolific in providing solar power for cellular towers. He has installed cellular, more than 1,000 cellular towers that are solar powered. So in the remote area, if you have cellular towers, you, people can have access to communication and digital information. It is an example of a villager pumping water. Here are some street lights. And you've seen this right here in Philadelphia, uh, parking meters, and also these are trash compactors. So there are remote applications that can easily be um, put together using low cost solar. Okay, here's now an example of how we use the, the global energy usage. You see here, Asia, of course, Asia consists of 48 countries. The usage of energy has grown tremendously. Now, I mean, here I have the uh, 
terawatt hours. One year has 8,760 hours. And this is here the power. And the worldwide consumption of power is about 16 terawatts. And in the US, we use around 3.35 terawatts. And sun throws on the surface 174,000 terawatts. So it's really, it's a challenge for us to think how best to utilize that. Okay, the energy access, it's here's a great, years ago when I used to talk about it, there were more than 1.2 billion people that had, didn't have any access to energy, particularly electric power. Today, that number has gone down to 300, 940 million. Actually, of that, 400 million people were in India. Remote villages, no electric power. Then you have 30 billion and 3 billion people that have no access to clean fuels. It used to be, and I don't know how it is now, in the developing countries, women will go spend six hours collecting firewood so that they could cook some meals. And there are ways that now you can don't have to do that kind of stuff. But anyway, the per capita electricity consumption varies more than 104 between the countries that are well-to-do compared with the countries that are poor. And uh, energy consumption varies for more than tenfold across the world. And energy access, obviously, is, is a difficult uh, challenge for people that are, don't have means and they're poorer countries. Here is an interesting plot that is well known, Human Development Index. You look at the, here we have the annual consumption of kilowatt hour per capita. Countries like Iceland, I see all these green countries have a very high level, high uh, quality of life. And you got a whole lot of average quality of life countries that are pink here, and the purple ones are extremely poor. And it is amazing to, these people are living in these sunny countries that are very, quite poor, and you have, Peak sunlight of hours, there are easily five to six hours available. If you give them about a half a kilowatt or a one kilowatt of a solar panel, that's nowadays is very cheap. Their lifestyle can improve dramatically. So here is the, you know, helping improving the lifestyle. Then we talked about the access to water. I was just talking briefly. The concept of air wells, I came to know about that few years ago, all the water that we get besides the artesian wells on the surface planet of Earth, that's clean water. It comes either as a rain or the snow or hailstorms or what have you. But so there's the water circulating in the atmosphere and now more so now because the ocean temperature has gone up. So there's a lot of water in the air. So there's a way to extract water. So there are uh, lots of um, researchers that have developed numerous techniques to extract water straight out of the air, even in desert area. So here's an example, but this one would require some power, uh, electric power, because what you have here, this air is moving in through a filter, but in that coil, condenser coil here, you have a, a refrigerant being circulated is a compressor that needs to be powered. And then uh, when the air goes through, the moisture condenses, it comes down, and they have an ozone generator that cleans, you know, disinfectant the water, and then it's filtered through water filters, and then it's ready to eat and ready to drink. This is one concept. There are numerous other concepts that are, have been developed with uh, without any, um, electric power in that, but it can be a way of extracting water straight out of the, the air. All right, now talk about habitats, heating and cooling. And uh, I think the countries like Denmark 
That's amazing. China, Germany, Austria, Israel. These are the countries very highly prolific in using the solar thermal energy. So here's an example. You have a solar collector. You're pumping in cold water. It comes out hot water. The hot water can be pumped into a resident. I mean, particularly I remember in Korea when I visited there, they had these uh, embedded uh, copper pipes in the floor. And you run hot water to give you radiant heat and you heat the house and you also have the hot water to for the domestic use and there are a number of ways to put these collectors you know this, these are evacuated tube collectors quite efficient and this is becoming more popular and as i said in in denmark they have what they call solar district heating a cluster of homes they get the solar hot water from a, a collector system and they not only heat the house but heat get the hot water i think something like that can be done here in <laughs> in this city okay now let's go into cooking this is this uh, american uh, solar oven can go up to 360 to 400 degrees c it has what it has it has concentrated that reflect the sunlight into the into the oven. But years ago, I came across this concept. It's it's company I think it's out of Japan called GoSun. Basically, it was originally designed for companies and uh, people that go out camping and they wanted to cook food. They don't want to have any fuel being carried. And what it is, it's a a tube that's a double walled evacuated tube. And you have a clamshell here. It reflects the light, I mean the sunlight, and heats the tube. Uh, you, you, this wooden paddle, you can put the food, uh, uncooked food on it, put it in there. In a matter of minutes, you can cook the food. This concept is now being developed even further for the bigger usage. The next thing I'm going to show you that is quite dramatic. I saw that personally, couldn't believe it. So anyway, you, there, is, there are ways in this go sun works even when it's a cloudy day, because as I showed you, there's a lot of infrared uh, part of the solar spectrum and it re reflects the infrared and heats up the place and cooks the food. Now let's look at this community cooking with the solar generated steam. In 2014, I visited this place in the state of Rajasthan in India. It's on Mount Tabu. And I was amazed to find out they were cooking 20,000 meals a day. And what it is, they just by concentrating, either in this form or individual concentrators, heat the water and make steam. And the steam is then piped into the kitchens, and in the kitchen, they cook large quantity of meals and let me show you that here is the actual kitchen as a mount tabu in india they're cooking twenty thousand meals a day this caught on they were the pioneers this was, uh, organization mount tabu were the pioneers in doing this no carbon footprint just the water goes in solar heat and so the steam goes to the kitchen and you've got the food cooked there now there are at least uh, three or four other uh, religious organizations. You might have heard about the Golden Temple. Uh, even there, you know, the Sikh community gives free food to people. They, so there are at least four of them in India besides this one that have adopted this steam cooking facility. Now this can be actually applied to places in this country, community cooking, and so that the, particularly the people that are poor don't have to worry about the fuel and all that stuff. There could be a centralized community cooking. You take your food there and, and go and cook it. There are lots of not only steam, but other ways to store the solar thermal energy and it can be used. I, was, I visited this place twice. I visited this place again in 2016. It was amazing to see how they produce this you know high, good quality healthy food 
with no carbon footprint. Okay, coming back to, you know, we talked about economic activities. I mean, all this renewable energy adaptation creates tons of jobs. And you see here all these yellow uh, bodies here are solar energy. The red one are bioenergy. The, the you know light blue are hydro and wind and then geothermal. But to look at the solar, each body here represents fifty thousand jobs. And I'm sure you've heard the solar industry is producing lots and lots of jobs. And it turns out you can train people, particularly in the solar industry, as far as the installer jobs are concerned. You don't necessarily need a PhD or a master's or bachelor's degree. You take, take some you know, uh, healthy person who's willing to work and learn how to do it. It can be done and it can create lots and lots of jobs as we go towards the adaptation of renewable energy. Anyway, um, I think there is a lot of potential for the solar energy to take care of the sustainability that we are focusing on. And I'd like to thank the audience, wherever you are, all of the, in the US and overseas, for your interest and attention. Hey, PJ, we have quite a number of questions for you, and uh, a number of them are kind of in one subject area, and I'll kind of condense them all for you. And that is on the environmental aspects of solar panels. So that includes producing raw materials, uh, manufacture, installation, and then potential for recycle and reuse. Okay, so what, what is the exact question? The question is, how does, what is the environmental impact of all of that activity and how does it compare to the benefits accrued from the solar panels? Historically, there have been some misunderstanding. Uh, the point in that is China in the early 1990s became very prolific and in fact played a role in increasing the production capacity and lowering the cost. What they were doing in the processing of silicon solar cells, whatever waste they had, they were dumping in the river. You know, that gave a bad reputation to the solar guys, but actually there is no reason why you cannot process that waste in an environmentally friendly way. Okay, and there are two questions on alternatives to silicon, uh, one on perovskites, and the other on uh, quantum dot. Yeah, okay. The <clears throat> perovskite solar cells uh, are under a lot of uh, research activity going on that now. Problem in that is, and I have I'm honestly have not kept up with all the latest uh, developments, but it used to be stability of that material was a big issue. And uh, I, I think uh, they are improving on that. And also, they also had things like um, lead in their structure. And I remember the China and the Japanese would not let this big company called First Solar that was making cadmium telluride solar cells go in there because it had cadmium in it. So I, the researchers have to look into how to get rid of the the elements that are not healthy and worry about the stability of the solar cells. But they do have, I saw in news recently, multi-junction perovskite type solar cells was reaching about 50% and they think they can go up to 60% of conversion. So on that side, it's promising. On the other side, you have to be mindful of the environmental safety. And I think that's the issue that is being worked on. Okay, and quantum dots? Quantum dots are, <laughs> I think the quantum dots are, if I recall, I've been <laughs> retired more than almost uh, eight years ago. They had these uh, uh, concentrators that concentrate the sunlight on these dot solar cells. 
they get a lot of output. I think it was Japanese that were doing some work on that. And there is a potential to develop that further, but uh, I do not know of a, a big company that's pr producing those in large quantities. Here's a question on commenting, clarifying the impact of GMOs on climate change. I think the genetically modified uh, uh, seeds, I was surprised that they were making tomatoes that had the genes been altered to put some scorpion seed um, genes in there, basically to fight the in insect, uh, insects. I think most of the European countries do not want to buy genetically modified foods. Now, part of the reason these things are done was simply to have a greater output, a lot more money, but it created an imbalance in the, in the natural cycle. So in fact, there are movements even in this country to go back to organic farming, original organic farming, non-GMO, and now those genetically modified uh, materials also required lots and lots of fertilizers, and they were chemical fertilizers that were being used. And uh, it actually created a lot of havoc, it, and particularly those in, uh, I know in, in uh, South India, there were a lot of farmers who had bought the GMOs and they, they had to take debts to go get the um, chemical fertilizers. But then there was a drought and they couldn't get the, the cash flow and a whole bunch of them committed suicide. That's not the way to go. You have to go back to in sync with what nature wants to do. There are lots of ways to do that. And using solar energy to help you achieve that, it can be done. Okay. Two related questions. One is what is the efficiency and practical practicality difference between large solar roof panels and smaller shingle ones? And then there's a second one on um, what is holding homeowners from wider adoption, pointing out that if you live in a single home for five years, you're not going to get a return on investment. Well, actually, from the energy point of view, the payback time for the solar these days is very low. It's a question, um, I don't know, is it more to the US scene or all over the world? Why the homeowners are not putting the solars on the rooftop? Is that what the question is? The question is, you know, what, what incentives, you know, have, what's the economic? Well, case? you know, very surprisingly, just about a week or so ago, I saw a news that the state of Virginia will pay a homeowner $2,000 just to agree to have a solar system put on their roof. Well, the point in that is, is that it is becoming very cost effective. Maybe in some cases, people are not able to buy it and they are giving incentives to put the solar on. And the other side, I was just commenting, I saw is last night that was how the utilities are deliberately putting roadblocks for the adaptation of solar and trying to give a bad name to the solar solar energy because they are afraid that it will affect their business the ideal way would be that they actually take an action and get involved with this is a question on are there advantages to leveraging solar power to produce hydrogen as an energy source oh yes uh, I will be talking about this hydrogen economy in another two months or so. The, the point is, why hydrogen has not been used, as I said, the Quebec Hydro is uh, very uh, prolific in that, is because they had a lot of power available to them. If you try to produce hydrogen by electrolysis with the old way when we electricity was not that cheap it was very expensive the most common way of producing industrial hydrogen today is from hydrocarbons but that creates you know greenhouse gases and all, all that stuff but when the electricity has become so very cheap and also there are some research 
uh, efforts going on in developing special kinds of anodes that they can make it a lot more easy to produce hydrogen by electrolysis of water. So I think uh, that you, I'm sure you heard about the green hydrogen and hydrogen economy. Uh, it is because in the process of electrolysis, you're not creating any uh, greenhouse gases. So it, as the prices of solar electricity goes down, and in the same time, when people and research further improves the electrolysis process, hydrogen bec will become a very common source of energy. As I've been reading about some unexpected effects of solar power and wind stations on migratory birds and other animals, resulting in the case of solar and vaporization. Are, there, are these reports mostly apocryphal? If not, what is being done to prevent such results so that we have a win-win situation? Okay, now windmills have been notorious for getting a lot of migratory birds killed. However, they are also becoming very sensitive and creating some, uh, you know, kind of alarms for the birds to move the because the wind mills are in the pathway where the migratory birds go. Also, there were some stories about the concentrated solar, pan, uh, solar power production where they were you know, focusing the solar energy to the towers. And if the birds went through there, they will be toasted. That's not, we, we're not talking about that. We're talking about photovoltaics and solar thermal. That, that doesn't kill the birds. Okay. Okay. What are the efficiency and practicality differences between large solar roof panels and smaller solar roof shingle panels for homeowners? Um, if the roof shingles are made out of uh, silicon solar panels, silicon solar cells, the efficiency will be pretty comparable. It's a question of the structure of the solar panels and how it is, uh, and also how the shingles are directed. You know, shingles are going to be fixed array, and if they are not facing south, they may not get as much uh, output as you would get out of the solar panels. And I think we're at the top of the hour, so um, I'll turn it back to you for any last comments and thoughts. Okay, thank you very much. Well, as you can see, in my presentation, the focus is solar energy is now actually in solar electricity is the cheapest way of producing electricity compared to any other means of producing electricity. And then there is so much of solar energy available to us. If only we use our you know, smart thinking to utilize the solar energy, both in solar thermal and solar electric, and we can have a great impact on the climate issue. And I talked, and I didn't mention that, there are ways to even do sequestration of carbon dioxide, to get the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So what that requires, the people all over the world should really understand this, that this is something to be made good use of. And we need to talk to our politicians, and the planners, I, I know the lobbyists of the fossil fuels are still fighting, fighting very hard, but that doesn't mean that we can just let them do what they are doing and damage the, the planet and the climate here. We need to really be very proactive in using solar energy and help improve the climate conditions and the lifestyle of the people all over the world. Thank you for watching this presentation. ACS Webinars is provided as a service by the American Chemical Society as your professional source for live weekly discussions and presentations that connect you with subject matter experts and global thought leaders concerning today's relevant professional issues in the chemical sciences, management, and business.